Hi, I'm Eric Prostowski. Welcome to another segment of EP on EP. Today, I have a buddy of mine for many, many decades. On, right. That's unfortunate, right? It is. Sad to say. <laughs> Sad to say. Uh, Dr. David Haynes, who's currently the director of the Heart Rhythm Center at William Beaumont University Hospital. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I know you're really shocked at this, but I'd like to talk to you about energy sources in ablation. Something you have. I, I've heard about that. I figured that. Yeah, so yeah. We have all these new toys. Right. And I know it's not fair to call them toys, but can you maybe do a quick rundown of what's available and what your thoughts are? So we, in terms of legacy ablation energies, of course, RF, it's the big daddy. It was there 40 years ago. It is still here, proven the test of time, highly reliable, but there are issues. We have cryoablation, we have laser ablation. These are all thermal ablation technologies, and they all work by freezing, by heating, and they're all fairly predictable. But the concern about thermal technologies is collateral damage. And we all lived through the era when contact force sensing was introduced and we were pushing those RF catheters into the posterior left atrial wall and all of a sudden atrial esophageal fistula was showing up with dire results. And so we now have pulse field ablation and it's taking the field by storm, but we don't have an approved system yet. So all we have is a limited number of patients from investigational studies, and, uh, and we'll see how that turns out. So let's, since PFA is the, um, is the uh, ablation du jour, right? I right. Mean, I, I agree. It is. Um, when I was at one of the meetings, the AF meetings uh, a few months ago, I was surprised to see the Europeans were presenting data, and it seemed like each system was a little different. So, so can you tell me a little bit about that? And like, does that mean that you, if you buy a, you, you can't, you, you, like, you have to learn your system? Uh, right. Wh why? Right. Why is that? So, so we're used to RF, which has a standard waveform that creates heat, and so it's just you know essentially like a soldering iron when you get right down to it. Um, pulse field ablation, the biology of it is very complicated and the parameters that are adjustable in the pulsed wave uh, delivery include amplitude, pulse duration, pulse number, inter pulse interval, number of pulses in a train, number of trains in a delivery. Uh, all of these things are highly proprietary and we don't know one system versus another. Yeah. And that really has led to I think kind of an untenable situation where researchers cannot compare commonalities between systems because, you know, if you've got one delivering nanosecond pulses and other microsecond pulses, it's a huge difference. Yeah. And also, um, you know, as with you and I have been through this for years with right. these systems, um, and there are always unexpected complications that come up. I think with the PFA, all this coronary involvement that I don't think anyone, I mean, when we, you saw it wasn't your, anticipated, right, because it was supposed to be specific for a certain uh, type of muscle or tissue. Right, right. Um, so you have thoughts on like what else we have to worry about if it hasn't been looked into? So, so to expand a little bit on that, there was a very um, disturbing case report of a circumflex coronary artery spasm when the pulse field energy was delivered on the mitral annulus in close contiguity to that artery. Turned out it was reversible, there was no infarct, patient did okay, but uh, there's been subsequent work in animals and a small series in humans where it's been reproducible that you get coronary spasm when you're too close to an artery with your delivery catheter. Now, the good news is that Nitroglycerin does seem to mitigate this to a great degree, and the recommendation is to initiate a nitro drip if you are ablating in that close vicinity to the artery. But there are unknowns. I mean, what happens if a patient has coronary artery disease? So do abnormal coronaries respond the same way? Can you get showers of emboli with distal uh, small vessel infarction after the spasm? 
you know, so I think that that is a, a potential concern that we don't know. And, and there's an interesting other concern the other way. I mean, I, I'm not a big believer, although I'm, I'm still will wait for the data, that you need to get rid of the ganglion plexus. That's part of right. why we win, right? right. So. I've heard some people very concerned say, you know, this technique doesn't affect the nerve. So are we, do, are, are we having sort of an unintended opposite reaction? Right. But of course, we don't know if that's really true, right? So, well, so first of all, you can damage nerves with pulse field, but it's a, do a dose and proximity okay. related response. So they are less sensitive to injury than they are to thermal techniques. But... Uh, the ganglionic plexi, uh, they don't seem to be affected much by pulse field. And I think time will tell. I think, you know, is there going to be a point at which we flip the switch to a thermal technique in the middle of a pulse field pulmonary vein isolation, doing uh, GP mapping to try right. and get those? Is that necessary if we're getting high success rates without GP uh, involvement? You know, maybe that's good enough. I think, you know, there are unknowns yeah, out here. I think it's a good point you raised, David. Um, if Look at the early results uh, that have come in. The success rate is not strikingly different from RF. Right. I mean, it's in that usual 65, 75 bandwidth. Right. And we know we're not getting rid of the ganglion plexus, so right. that would be a little maybe on the, I mean, no one knows for sure, but that speaks a little against the fact you have to knock out the ganglion plexus, right? Right, right. And the, the yeah, other thing about pulse field that um, I have stated uh, inaccurately in earlier days of the technology that contact is not important. Yeah. Well, contact, I think, is important. Okay. And so I think that some of the less impressive success rates that are coming out now may be a fact that, uh, uh, virtue of the fact that the catheter is not really pressing into tissue. It may be just kind of bouncing off the surface. And, yeah. and when you do that, a lot of the, the voltage gradient kind of goes into the blood and there you can get, you know, a 20, 30 percent drop in voltage gradient in the tissue when you're not in good contact. Okay. So, so um, we need to learn more and we need to have more systems out there in more hands. And Will they ever be in a head-to-head -head comparison? You know, because everyone is different, right? And that brings in a whole new it's unlikely complexity, though, right? right? So let me right. let, let me end with some some thoughts from you on the fact that everything done now, it, 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 expectedly so, has been PVI, right? But we both know that there are areas that you have to attack in different right. patient groups that right. are not PVI, right? I, other than success or failure, do you anticipate any potential? unexpected complications if you're going after like a left atrial appendage or an SVC right. that haven't been looked at. What are your thoughts on that? So I, I, I do think that there are certain uh, areas where the kind of lack of controllability of pulse field will preclude its use, like in particular close to the AV node. Okay. I think one big potential risk is because pulse field is so fast and easy some operators may be inclined to just keep ablating, and we talk about the so-called red atrial syndrome. That is to say, the voltage map post-ablation shows no viability. Yeah. That's not necessarily in the patient's right. best interest. Yeah, I hear you. David, it's been a wonderful discussion. Thanks sure. so much for joining the show. Okay, thank you, Eric.